There we go. So I got the recording started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, just some quick news about PASS before uh, we get kicked off here. We've got, uh, for a speaker today, we've got uh, Joshua Ludeman, and he's going to be talking about big data automation with HD Insight up in the cloud. So just to uh, give a few notes about PASS itself, we do have the Business Analytics Conference coming up here in Santa Clara, coming up on the 20th of April. Um, if you're going to be in the area, if, if you are interested in analytics, if HD Insight is something that, that you dig into, um, this may be something for you to check out. Um, go take a look at the speaker list, take a look at the sessions. Uh, you may find that this is just that perfect session for, get, I mean, that perfect conference for digging deeper into the data. The analytics conference is really about getting into the data and looking at the analytics and, and being able to derive results and value out of that data. If, if you are passionate about SQL Server, and you know, hopefully you are because you're in this session here today about HD Insight, or actually if you're passionate about data, um, there's more than just this virtual chapter that's out there. Uh, pretty much if there is something that you are interested in, there is a virtual chapter to suit your needs, uh, whether it's business analytics, uh, Excel, span if you want to see your um, sessions in Spanish, PowerShell, um, security, there's numerous virtual chapters that are out there. Um, I think last year, actually, the Spanish virtual chapter uh, was delivering, I think, almost like a presentation a week, if not more than that, um, for, for native Spanish speakers. So there is definitely um, something regarding data that you can get out there and find more data, on, I mean, more information on. Uh, there are some upcoming meetings uh, to uh, point out. Uh, today's the 11th, so most of these have already happened, uh, but... There is a DBA Fundamentals that's coming up with Paul Randall um, in, in just a week. I definitely recommend uh, sitting in on any Paul Randall presentation where he is talking about backups. And then, of course, we're going to be talking a little bit about PowerShell today. There is a PowerShell virtual chapter if you want to make uh, more use of it um, after you see what uh, Josh is able to do today. Uh, SQL Saturdays are something that you can often find more information on and uh, get together with, locally with people. Uh, coming up on April 11th is uh, Madison and Huntington Beach, and then you also got Richmond in the Silicon Valley still coming up this month. Uh, so there's SQL Saturdays that are happening all over the world. If you want to go someplace sunny, there is Costa Rica, or if you want to just get out of, um, find something local to you and, and you're not within North America, you know, Brisbane, Budapest, Exeter, Joinville, um, there's SQL Saturday is happening virtually every Saturday, and in some cases, multiples. It is coming up to um, the past summit. It's coming up in just a few months, and that's going to mean that there's going to be a lot of need for volunteers to have that event to pull off. The uh, If you're interested in volunteering for a pass, um, similar to what I'm doing here with the the cloud virtual chapter, uh, there's lots of different things you can do anywhere from reviewing abstracts to running virtual chapters. Um, go out to volunteer.sqlpass.org and you can find out about some of the more local opportunities and then also up upgrade your pass profile to include um, what you're interested in volunteering. Um, for our chapter itself, um, I did want to point out we do have one scheduled upcoming meeting for later this month on March 23rd and it's going to be an introduction, introduction to Azure Data Factory with Steve Hughes. Um, if you notice, I don't have any other um, sessions listed for the upcoming months, and that's because we need more speakers. So if you are interested in speaking on SQL Server, um, or actually speaking on data, and basically talking about anything related to data and the cloud, um, this is really a place where you can, you can do that and uh, work, uh, you know, talk to your peers and uh, let them know what you've been doing and give them ideas on what they can do to uh, leverage cloud in their environment. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand the uh, session over to Joshua Ludeman, and he is going to take it away. Just Thanks, Jay. Open here, and I will make him presenter. All right, Josh, it is all yours if you want to just take it away. Thanks, Jason. Let's see here. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing okay today. 
Um, this is a very nice session. Um, what we're going to go over today is uh, big data automation using HD Insight, also using PowerShell, using them together um, to kind of I will set up this session and created it to show people how HD Insight could actually be used operationally in your own environment um, in a scenario where maybe, um, obviously not maybe, most budgets are limited in some way, shape, or form. This session, by the end of it, will give you the tools um, and a lot of the basic knowledge to be able to set up HD Insight clusters on demand automatically. Um, and minimize the amount of billing from the HD Insight service that you will incur. Um, so it's going to be a one-hour session. If you have any questions, please put them in the question section, um, and I'll answer them um, by the end of the session, or at least at the end, if not during, depending on the question. Um, scripts will be made available for download. I'll get them out to, um, uh, to out on my Twitter account, which will be available here um, so that you can actually screenshot it or write it down. And I will actually tweet out a link to um, the scripts, the DAC, you know, basically all the supporting documentation that we'll go over here. So first of all, a little about me. Um, I'm Josh Ludeman. Um, I blog at joshludeman.com, Twitter at, as you can imagine, Josh Ludeman. Um, have, I'm also a business intelligence consultant with Pragmatic Works. I focus on BI, um, but also in the cloud, big data, um, analytics, uh, kind of all that that other side of the shop. Um, also, I'm a proud father. Those are my girls right there, Emma and Erica. And I'm also a fashion consultant. So if you feel the need, um, like you feel like you need a reflect, refreshed look, um, obviously get in touch with me. So we're going to go over a few things, well, not a few, a bunch of things today. But we're going to kind of cover what is HD Insight for any of those who don't really know the name of the service or what it is. Um, some of the prerequisites you're going to need um, to start doing automation with HD Insight. Um, also, we're going to look at, since we look at HD Insight, I do like to cover some of the other deployment options that you have when talking about Hadoop as a whole. Um, what are the deployment options for um, HD Insight itself and in different ways you can deploy the service, different features or um, that you can turn on or off. Um, how does it all work together? So I'll go through a, a high level of how Azure comes together to build an HD Insight cluster, what pieces of Azure are used. We'll also go over with the power, you know, what we can do with PowerShell and HD Insight, create an automated deployment and then go over a full HD Insight automation example of how you would automate um, standing up a cluster, uploading a file to your blob storage, processing that file, putting that output into blob storage, and then also downloading that file from your blob storage. So first of all, before we can kind of talk too much about what what is HD Insight, well, what is Hadoop? I would imagine most, peop most people understand what it is, so that's why this is just one slide, just to make sure everybody's on the same basic, you know, same basic level. Um, Hadoop is designed to be run on a cluster. It's paralyzed, parallelized processing and storage. Um, it was designed to use commodity hardware, but like anything we do, um, the better hardware you put into it, the better cluster you'll have. Um, it distributes data and processing, like I said, throughout the cluster. So as many machines as you have, or it distributes them out through all the as machines as much as possible with its own algorithms of, um, of distribution. Um, through you can have multiple racks of servers as well. Um, Hadoop itself is a top-level project of Apache, which means it is open source. Um, but within that, Hadoop itself is just a file system. So you, it's a top-level project with all these other projects underneath it, like Hive, which allows you to set up a, um, a specific um, like a table metadata structure over top of the data within your files within the file system. Um, PIG is like your SSIS of Hadoop. Um, how it gives you some options with um, 
machine learning, predictive analytics, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's a lot of other options. There's Spark, Flume, Scoop, all kinds of these funny names that you know we think are funny names, but they're actually a lot of valuable tools that work with Hadoop that can build out your analytics side of your business or your, your organization. But it, more than anything else, Hadoop itself opens doors, like it says here, for processing non-traditional data sources. So when I say non-traditional, we're talking about things, you know, not CSV files. Hadoop isn't, it, it can do it. Is it the best tool for the job? Probably not. Um, but it opens doors to reading documents. Um, there's an example I know of, of a Hadoop cluster set up with distributed processing that it actually has machine learning algorithms running on it, a collection of them that run together to actually read commercial construction um, specification documents so that it can actually understand in, in as much as a machine can the data that's in that document and be able to group documents together by the information in the document. A lot of neat, lot of neat doors that this opens up. And you're like, okay, so that's what Hadoop is. What is HD Insight? Well, it's the platform that is part of Azure that actually runs HD Insight, or runs Hadoop, I mean. So with HD Insight, it's not just Hadoop. There's also HBase, which is, um, again, like a database version of Hadoop. Um, Storm for advanced processing. Um, you can also run there's some other different flavors that they're coming out with all the time. It's actually very hard to keep up. <laughs> um, it runs Hortonworks um, data platform. So remember, Hadoop is open source. And when you get into a lot of the commercial offerings of open source projects, a lot of companies will um, basically create their own flavor of an open source project. Um, and then build additional pieces onto it that they'll sell those pieces or sell support. Um, Hortonworks is another one of those vendors that actually um, works with support, training um, around uh, Hadoop, and they actually have their own flavor called Hortonworks Data Platform. Now the advantage or d disadvantage, depending on how you look at it and what, how your shop is set up, Hortonworks Data Platform actually has a version of win uh, that runs on Windows Server. Um, and as far as I know at this point, it's the only version of um, Hadoop that is uh, supported in that way um, to run on Windows Server. Um, you can select from multiple versions of, Hort of Hortonworks Data Platform or HDP um, out there. Um, and when you set up HD Insight, you can do it as well. So the whole idea is, is Azure is selling you platform, uh, your time on that platform, and in essence, what it's running on the back end of Azure is HDP running on Windows Server VMs. So when we talk about HD Insight, again, whoop, sorry about that. When we talk about HD Insight, we're talking about its Hortonworks data platform flavor running, in plat running on the Azure platforms. So when we want to talk about Hadoop as a whole, what other deployment options are available for you? Um, these are mainly, these are on-premises options. Um, if you get into HD Insight and maybe see that you would want something running um, either more often or within your own infrastructure, um, the other options out there are the raw Apache distribution, um, which is only set up to run on Linux, same with Cloudera's. Um, but the advantage of Cloudera, they're a company like Hortonworks that has their own flavor of it, but it also has their own parts that they've created and additional add-ins to um, the Cloudera Hadoop platform. Um, and then Hortonworks, again, does have a Linux as well, and that's how they started out, but they also have the Windows Server version. Um, and it's packaged up nicely, um, easy to install, um, and same with the Windows version, very easy to install. And then there's some other cloud deployment options. You have Amazon ECC, which is a full functioning Hadoop instance, um, and then Elastic MapReduce, uh, which would fall into the same category as HD Insight, less management, it's more of a platform. And then Hadoop on Google Cloud, um, you can go through them. Um, it's not one of the more um, public options out there, but it's fully functioning, um, and you manage the cluster yourself. So I talked about earlier that we were going to go over some prerequisites. 
To do any of this automation that we're going to go over today with HD Insight, um, there are a few things you're going to need. The Azure PowerShell commandlets, um, and as you can see, this is underlined here. Um, it's actually the link to download the commandlets. So um, when I make the deck available, you'll be able to click on that link. It'll take you right to it so you don't have to you know, start using any Google or Bing Fu or anything like that to find it. Um, the, you're going to need .NET Framework 4.5 at a minimum um, and a basic knowledge of PowerShell um, or a basic understanding of just um, English noun and verb. Um, that's, for a basic knowledge of PowerShell, that's really all you need to understand is what you want to do and what you want to do it to. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit more in depth um, when we get talking about the actual PowerShell itself. Um, since this is an Azure service in the cloud, you will need an internet connection. Some understanding of .NET is helpful, um, but as you can see in the examples I'll give, it's not required by any shape, you know, any shape or form. Um, but it is helpful to kind of help understand, help you understand how to move forward. Um, and also, there's .NET commandlets or .NET pieces as well, so that you can actually write write C sharp to actually do the same thing that I'm doing, and as part of some of these supporting files, there'll be, uh, there's an actual .NET example in C-sharp um, that I have in a text file, just to kind of show you some of the basics of how to stand up a cluster and things like that. So if you remember, I told you there were some deployment options with HD Insight. Um, those deployment options basically revolve around, obviously, how many nodes you're going to have in the cluster, um, where you want to put the cluster. Also, it's going to get into your metadata storage. Now, when I say metadata, again, if you're, um, if you're still new to Hadoop, um, the metadata storage kind of revolves around Hive and Uzi. Hive itself is part of the Hadoop project. Is, if you remember, I mentioned it earlier, it's actually what some call it, refer to as the data warehouse um, level over top of the data stored in Hadoop. So it basically creates um, an, a relational database esque layer over top of the data you're storing in Hadoop so that you can query it with a SQL like language called HiveQL. Now, all the metadata that tells Hive how that data is stored and how to how to refer to it or how the queries need to refer to it to pull it when running a Hive query, all that metadata is stored in a database. Uzi itself is job scheduling. So all that metadata that you, if you think about it from a SQL Server perspective, that you would have in MSDB or any of the system databases around the agent, all that information is going to be in the Uzi database. So those metadata databases are stored one of two ways in HD Insight. In HD Insight, it's either stored in a Derby database, which is, again, one of those NoSQL options. Again, it's open source, so um, that's the way they wanted to go for this. Um, the Derby database is my, now again, the second bullet point is my opinion, should be used for, for a lot of one and done situations. Um, there's also situations where you're going to use it on a regular storage solution or a regular operating solution um, where you would want to use a Derby database. Um, and that's fine, keeps costs down and things like that. Um, but the option I usually use when I'm setting up my clusters is the external metadata storage. And what that is, is where we'll store the metadata around Hive and Uzi in an Azure SQL database. Now it is great for um, recurring solutions, makes it easier to drop and recreate because now you're doing is reattaching to that metadata storage. Um, when you create a new cluster, um, to do pick up basically where you left off last time. Um, but also one of the other uh, more interesting scenarios is if you have at some of the larger companies, and I know this is a fact, I've worked in some of those companies, worked with them, that sort of thing, who maybe are using the same data set stored in your blob storage, and you have maybe two different departments trying to work on that data. So maybe you have your marketing department working on, um, and your sales department, and they're both working on the same set of data files around um, prospective customers. So they want to use the same, they want to use the same data, but their usage of their cluster, you don't want one's usage to affect the other. 
or they want to bill out separately, which is also a common scenario. So that sales doesn't want to share billing with marketing. With the external metadata storage, you can actually um, you have two clusters running against the same data, so the same storage layer, using the same metadata storage since it's an Azure SQL database, and they can actually run their own clusters against that data and those metadata sources or databases. So again, that's kind of a little. Um, might scramble your brain a little bit, but again, if you, you shoot me an email after my session, um, I'll be glad to kind of go over that for you more in depth. So again, we were going to talk about, I mentioned earlier, how does Azure come together for HD Insight? What kind of pieces are we looking at? So I mean, we're going to need a place to store our data for HD Insight to work with. For that, we actually use um, uh, Azure Storage Account and using a blob storage account with containers. Now again, for the, if you're using an external metadata um, database, we're going to use um, Azure SQL database to store that database. Doesn't need to be that large, um, but you do want it larger than, say, the one gigabyte smallest copy. Um, you're going to want something a little bit larger, um, just because the more usage you put into it, more jobs, more hive tables, things like that, that database is obviously going to grow. Um, it's going to get a head node, which is, um, the head node's always there, um, but it's using Azure VMs to do it. Now, you can enable um, remote desktop, though when you set up an HD Insight cluster, by default, remote desktop into the head node is not set up, um, just because of, to kind of control resources, because, um, and as you'll see, PowerShell gives you a lot of different options and a lot of power um, when it comes to communicating with your cluster. That if there are some rare occasions where you would want a remote desktop into your head node, um, but most of them have been kind of taken care of with a lot of the commands that's out there in PowerShell. And then management of your cluster or maintenance, that's all handled by Azure support. So again, that's another advantage of looking at cloud platforms is um, a lot of the maintenance can kind of come off of your own internal IT staff because Azure will take care of it. So the, there's a few basic parts when you're trying to build a script for HD Insight, um, and we'll kind of go through them and how to set them up. You're going to obviously want to authenticate with your account because Azure is going to want to make sure it's putting all these objects on the correct account, um, which is very easy to do incorrectly, so we'll go over that pretty well. Um, because actually I did that when I was pre-baking our demos for today. Um, provision storage. Um, so we're going to go through and obviously since we need, since blob storage is one of those pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, that we put together to make HD Insight, we're going to go ahead and I'll show you how to provision that storage. Um, I'll also go over two different ways to deploy a cluster. One being what I call the basic cluster, which is an internal metadata store. Um, and then also the external metadata store, and we'll go through how to provision an Azure SQL database server, um, provision an Azure SQL database on that, um, and then the basic commands um, for deploying a cluster in either one of those scenarios. We'll also go over a basic example of, um, two basic examples of either how to um, send a Hive query to a cluster, um, and also um, just how to send a pig job to a cluster, how to create it and send it out there. Um, now the nice thing is too is we'll, we'll kind of go over some pieces of that um, and there's actually a couple different ways you can do it, especially or specifically with Hive. And then obviously the most important step, and I can never say this enough, is right here, destroy your cluster when your work is done. Um, if you're familiar with the more mechanical um, gasoline pumps that uh, it, specifically in the U.S. were haven't been around, I think, since maybe the 90s at the latest, so in the last 20 years. Um, but I like to use this as an analogy for this, that as long as your HD Insight clusters are deployed and running with it, or with a status of running in the Azure Management Portal, um, if you think of those old mechanical gas pumps, that number is just continually spinning like you're pumping gas. You're constantly building up charges when those clusters are running. And those clusters do not 
or those clusters do not stop billing until you send the remove command or destroy them as I use in this case. Or um, So I mean, you're going to want to pay attention to that and that's probably one of the most important steps of any kind of HD Insight automation um, because if you leave your clusters running, A, the next time the script runs, it will fail because it won't be able to deploy the cluster because it will already exist. Um, and B, that creates a large bill, uh, which not all managers are excited to see. So next, let's go through some demos. That's the fun part everybody likes. So first one we're going to start with, and I have this in two different PowerShell windows. Um, just full disclosure, I did pre-bake these um, just be for in, in the interest of time um, because a cluster, depending on what's going on in Azure, in the region you're trying to deploy the cluster, um, cluster deployment can take anywhere from a few minutes up till 20. Um, I'm glad I pre-baked these and started them deploying earlier uh, because the clusters took the upwards of 20 minutes um, to get set up for um, our session today. So as you can see, um, if you remember the checklist I kind of went through, first thing we want to do is authentication. Um, so here um, I'm loading up some variables to use throughout the script, including um, these are around the authentication piece, um, some cluster information variables, things like that. This right here is not a full automation script. This script right here, just so you know, as we're going through it, is just one I set up to kind of walk through um, for us to build the cluster um, and show you how all the pieces come together. Um, specifically here, this will be for our Hive query example. This is just a basic Hive query that will pull results from a Hive sample table, which comes um, on HD Insight. Again, some, this is for our more advanced cluster, just some more configuration um, variables and things like that. Um, but this right here is an interesting piece that I wanted to cover. So when you're creating your, um, specifically your Azure SQL databases or your clusters, you're going to want to use a, um, a, what's called a PS credential or a PowerShell credential. Um, part of doing that is you have to actually take your password, send it to a secure string to create it, and then actually create the full credential and pass that in when you're creating the Azure SQL database server or the Hadoop cluster. Um, because with those, um, that's the only way it'll accept it. Otherwise, if you do not pass these as a secure string, excuse me, and the full credential, um, PowerShell will look for that input from you with, a, with uh, what, you, what most uh, developers would um, know of as, a, as an alert box and an input box, it'll ask you to enter in the username and password um, so that it will convert the password to a secure string and create the credential. Um, so this is handy so that you don't have to be there for that. Now here's where we get into the authenticating with your account. Um, there's a couple different ways to get into Azure or to authenticate with Azure. There is the option, which again is only if you're babysitting your script as it's running, is to add an Azure account where you, it'll pop up a web browser box that'll actually ask you to enter in a username and password to the Azure account that you want to use for the execution. Um, once you start putting these scripts into production or even advanced testing of a regular solution, you're going to want to get an Azure published settings file, which in essence is a certificate. So the, that machine you're basically telling Azure is, I have this certificate right here, and you can't see me, but I'm holding up my hand. I have this Azure certificate, and I am allowed to work with this account. And it will pass an encrypted account key that will say, tell Azure, oh, this guy has full access, or girl, has full access to this account. So he can, you know, he or she can um, execute any scripts and that sort of thing. Um, so the published settings file is what I usually recommend. Um, for once the, once the project or script has moved past maybe a proof of concept stage um, where you're going to want to schedule it more often without user intervention, um, you're going to want to look to switch over the authentication um, on that box and in your script to using a published settings file. 
Now, once you've authenticated with a specific account you want to use, you're also going to need to select the subscription, which is very easy to do. As you can see here, I'm actually saving the subscription um, by getting it with a, you know, by using the variable from earlier subscription name so that I can pick um, a subscription from the list of subscriptions within that account because an account can have multiple subscriptions. So maybe your account has a pay-as-you-go subscription, which is just that, pay by the, you know, pay-as-you-go with each service that you create. Um, you may have a free trial on there as well. Um, so that you have the, I think it's $200 right now of free Azure credit. Um, and you may also have on your account an MSDN subscription, which gives you a certain amount of dollars per month for free. So you want to make sure that your script is in some way configured to pick from the correct subscription that you want to use for executing this. So you'll pick that here. And then we'll go through and... Just like anything, if you remember Legos from when you were younger or yesterday, depending on if you're me or not, because I used them yesterday, um, you may want to, um, you're going to want to start building from the ground up, like with anything else. So you're going to go ahead and start with setting up your new storage account if you don't already have one. Um, now again, the productionalized script that I'll cover before we close up for the, for the session, I'll show you um, in putting in some if-then logic, things like that based off of a configuration file um, that you can use to, for deployment. And we'll go over that later. But again, um, after we create that storage account, we need to put the, put the storage account address um, into its, um, if, you know, your, your format for um, finding it with, um, or for the format needed for deploying the cluster, which it needs its full path. You'll also get the storage account key and create it, um, and then also the context, the storage context, which you'll need for creating containers. Now, HD Insight clusters do need to run in containers, um, and so for our uh, two demos, I've created a, what's called a custom container, so this is the custom cluster um, where I'm using some of the cluster, the uh, Azure HD Insight cluster config values um, and tweaking those a little bit. And then this basic container is the container within the same storage account that will run um, my basic cluster, which is just a single line um, creation script. Now, as part of your automation, you may want to um, actually add a file to your blob storage for processing once your cluster is up and running. Um, in this specific example, I took a CSV file, which is just um, the data export from the vTarget mail view in AdventureWorks, put it into a CSV file, and then with this, this command right here, we're actually taking that file, which the path was declared at the top, putting it into the custom container um, with the blob name. Now remember with blobs, blobs are a little bit different than File Explorer. Um, there's the path to the file is the actual file name. So if you want to group files together in the same folder, um, and how we think of file folders in File Explorer, you're going to want to put that name in here. So in this case, workspace slash target mail at a .csv, that's going to put that vTarget mail file into a workspace folder off the root of the Hadoop file system. So now again, I said this is the basic cluster um, that we do first, and as you can see, it's just one command with a lot of different configuration uh, parameters. Um, but basically, the, it's just kind of it's basic knowledge or basic um, stuff that we're passing to the command um, just so they can set up the cluster. We're going to tell it, you know, what cluster, what name we want to give the cluster, where we want to put it, that we want some verbose logging the storage account name to use for the cluster, the storage account key so that we're passing that to HD Insight so that HD Insight can actually use the storage account, um, the storage container name for the cluster, which in this case, as you can see, is our basic container name, the number of nodes that we want to put in the cluster, and then the actual credentials, which again, as you can see, is the um, PS credential that we created at the top of the script. 
So what we did is we went ahead and run that script and over here we've got right here we actually have our cluster set up and um, is processing. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Confused it when I dragged windows. So for right there, you can see we've got our cluster set up, and it's our basic one, which is the virtual community HTTP or Hortonworks data platform cluster running on the most current version, um, and its operating system is Windows Server because now actually one of the new features out there for HD Insight coming down the road is they're going to offer different flavors of HD Insight. Um, so right here you can see it's a cluster type of Hadoop, um, and then it's running on Windows Server. Okay, so now for our example, we're going to take it one step further. Let me bring that back up. is how do I use it once I get it set up out there? So for our cluster, what we're going to do is we have to actually tell PowerShell that, hey, I want to use this cluster. So we go ahead and run the use H Azure HD Insight cluster, and it'll actually connect your PowerShell ses uh, session, as you can see, successfully connected to the cluster. It'll connect to it so that now you can send commands directly to your cluster. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to put into the variable data, we're going to invoke that Hive query string that we saw earlier, which was just a basic select star from a sample table. So we'll go ahead and run that statement, and it'll take a couple minutes to run, um, but then it'll actually return all that data back into that variable, and then we can either maybe pass the contents of that variable into a text file um, locally. We can... Um, filter that data down even more. Um, but as you can see, it shows right here that it's created a job, the job number, um, its step number, and then it's waiting for it to run. But then at the end, of course, like I said before, our most important step, we need to remember to remove the Azure HD Insight cluster. So while that's running, because I used to love watching Julia Childs when I was younger, so I'm going to keep going like her onto the next dish, shall we say. Let's talk about the um, custom cluster. So with the custom cluster, what we're going to want to do, depending on whether or not we have the Azure SQL database already set up, um, which in this case I do, um, I'm just reusing one that we already have on our account. Um, if you want to create a new one, you just give it a variable to put all of that data, that information about that server it's going to create into, um, and then you're going to tell it, I need to create a new SQL database server with this user username and this password in this location. Now, like all of these, this location is all going to be East US just because that's where I'm located, um, and it's easier for me to get that data. Once we get that database server, we're going to want to we're going to or create it. We're going to want to put the name into the full path format um, because again, that's a, one of the things we're going to need for actually creating the cluster, which I'll show you later. Now, I can tell you one of the most important steps when you're doing a custom cluster, like I define it here, or a cluster using an external meta database um, in Azure SQL Database you need to make sure you remember to add your firewall rule. Um, if you do not add that firewall rule, there will be a problem when you try to stand up your cluster because this firewall rule allows your Azure SQL database to talk with Azure. Um, if you're familiar with Azure SQL databases, by default, when you create an Azure SQL database server, it's cut off from everything just about. It doesn't, you in fact have to create a firewall rule for the machine you're working on to be able to connect to an Azure SQL database server um, with Management Studio. So in th this case right here, what we're doing is we're telling it, you can talk to anything Azure. 
Now maybe in your specific case, you may also want to create another firewall rule in here to allow the IP address of the server that you're using to create and, and destroy or remove these clusters so that in the case of wanting to be able to query that data, you want to make sure that it has that firewall rule out there. Um, and if you want to do that, um, and when you're wrapping this in more of a productionalized solution, you're going to want to do some kind of um, try and catch. Um, so try and create the rule with that name, um, allowing all Azure services. And if it doesn't, if it's not able to correct it because it's already there, um, go on to the next step, that sort of thing. Um, but again, those are all part of productionalizing a script that if you're doing any kind of automation and you've done it before, you understand that those are things you just need to do anyways to cut down on errors that are you know, not useful. So once we have our Azure SQL database server set up, we need a database. Now all we need to do for this database is just pass it in to the server we want to create the database on, the name that we want to give that database, and then what addition to use. Now with additions, that we have to pick from the basic. Um, business is not allowed to be used anymore. Um, I don't think basic is either. Uh, premium or standard. Premium and standard are the new service tiers. Um, actually, basic is allowed. Premium and standard are new, some of the new ba uh, service tiers out there. Um, is part of the V12 preview. If you're not familiar with the Azure SQL Database V12 preview, it opens up a lot of doors that puts Azure SQL Database um, more in the same area of on-prem uh, SQL databases and with, uh, as far as features are than it's ever been before. Um, and I definitely urge you to take a look at some of those, uh, some of the posts out there from the Azure CAT team and Microsoft itself detailing those features. Um, there are too many to go over and, and really outside the scope of today. So here we are now at the step of where we're going to create our cluster configuration um, and then pass into our statement to create the cluster itself. So with that, um, it kind of gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit more um, about some of the features of PowerShell. So with PowerShell, um, you'll notice here with this specific script, it's one, it's supposed to be one long statement. But what we're going to do is we're going to pipe all these smaller, these five smaller statements and do what's called piping to pass the output or pa pass the output from one command into the next command into the next command. Now this isn't dust on your monitor or mine, this is actually a tick mark. So with that tick mark, we're telling PowerShell, hey, this command, just because the line, there's nothing more on this line, this command continues on the next line. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, take this cluster configuration that says this is how many nodes I want, take the output of that command and push it into this one, where I'm going to set the, in the default storage account um, and container for my cluster. And then what I want you to do is take it and pipe it into this command here, where I'm going to create my Metastore database for Uzi. Now you remember, I only created, if you remember, I only created one database before. Now the nice thing about who, uh, Uzi and Hive, I almost said Hoobie, <laughs> Uzi and Hive are those two um, metadata bases. They um, don't have any conflicting table names or views or anything like that. So there, there's the convenience available that you can put both meta stores in the same data, physical database. So that's what I've done here. I'm only creating one database and I'm putting all the Uzi and all the Hive metadata tables into the same database. That's, there's the value in there that you're only paying to have one database um, available for you. Um, also the simplicity, so that you can name your Azure SQL database metadata store, um, the name of the, maybe you want to name it the uh, name of the cluster underscore metastore. However you want to do it, or underscore ms, whatever, um, but as far as Azure PowerShell is concerned, you need to declare them separately. Even if they are the same database, Azure needs to make sure that you understand that you're creating two metadata databases. So 
So right here, we're going to pass up this, the information, the name and credential um, for the Uzi Metastore, and then we're going to go ahead and pass in the same information here for a Hive Metastore. Again, piping these two, all these previous commands into each other until we get here to the same command we used earlier in this script to create our basic cluster. And with our basic cluster, or with this command, we're going to pipe all this information into this command where we're just going to tell it. Um, I want to use, do it in, my, um, in the location that's declared in that variable, which in this case is East US. I want to give it this name that's stored in this variable, custom cluster name. And here's the credentials that I want to use to be able to log into my cluster. Now this login will come into play um, when trying to create jobs um, or to reconnect to um, reconnect to maybe an HD Insight cluster that is already running um, before you open this specific or this um, instance of your PowerShell ISE. Um, you'll need to be able to have those credentials to be able to connect to it. Um, you notice I didn't need that before to use it, and that was because I'm already connect in a way you had already authenticated the cluster because I created the cluster. Once you run this script, again, it took about 20, 25 minutes, and then that cluster was set up. And then, again, you see how we're using the use Azure HD Insight cluster, passing it the name, um, just like we did before, and now we're connected. So one of the things you can do um, is, you, you remember earlier, we used this command to invoke um, Hive, is, as it was called. But basically what we were doing is we were sending a query to Hive. And we asked for that data to be returned in the data variable. So now if we do this, you can see what it does is it returns all that data into a large array. So the output of that query was put into a system or system dot array type object in PowerShell, and if I just type that, it'll spit out all the data that's in it, and there you go. It's I believe this is sales data around handsets in the U.S. Um, wireless handsets. It's very old. There's an iPhone, I think, two or three in there. Um, i500s from Samsung. It's rather old. Um, but again, that just shows that you know our query returned all that data and put it into there. So now another way to do this, um, and we'll go over here, is to actually create job definitions and jobs and then schedule them. So in this case here, and I won't be able to show you the output um, before the end of it because it takes it takes about 10 to 15 minutes just for this job to run. We have 10 minutes left. So. Um, for this job here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder for the job status information to be put into on the cluster. And then I'm going to go ahead and create the job definition. Um, and for that job, we're going to do a pig job. So for this, I've just got some basic commands here um, for pig where I wanted to dump the results out um, into the job output, um, not necessarily into a file, but you can do that as well. Um, we want to... Um, filter the data, we're going to load the data, filter it, maybe group it, um, generate some counts off of that, and um, reorder it by the count itself, um, descending to put our, our largest counts on top, and then again dump out that results. So for that, go ahead, we'll go ahead and run those, and we'll create this pig job definition. All the job definition is, is what do you want to do, so your query, and where do you want to put the output of it, or the status. So there we go, we've created our pig job definition, and then right here we're going to write the, um, I have in here some write host stuff that you may want to do, some write host information, just to make the console look a little bit nicer, so that if you're checking in on this job while it's running on a server, um, you'll be able to see where it's at. You can add in timestamps as well. Um, which I do recommend. Uh, um, you can change foreground colors. Here is green. Um, obviously, when I get down into errors, um, you can do them in red as well. Um, but here, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to 
start the job from the job definition that we already created. We created a job. We're going to start the insulate job um, on our cluster and tell it which job definition to use for this job. And then you have to put in your weights and things like that um, for your job to run. Um, and then here what we'll do is we'll dis you know, do, um, display the error log and then display the cluster or within that error log. We're going to get the job output for standard error and we're going to get the job output for standard output to get the, correct, the uh, output of the job, so the solution. In this case we would use red obviously for error instead of green. But the most important thing again is once we've once the output has been handled, however you want to handle it, um, whether it may be putting that output into a text file, um, which would be very simple to use, do even in PowerShell, to actually take it, put it into a variable, and then push that very, the data in that variable into a text file and save it to your blob storage. Um, but most importantly, once we're done with any kind of processing, we want to make sure to remove our cluster. So now that we've actually done both, we're done with both of our clusters, we're going to go ahead and remove our clusters. And as you can see, our custom cluster is already removed. And when I bring it up here and refresh, We have no HD Insight clusters because both of our remove statements have completed successfully. Okay. Now the other script I have, and I'll just kind of go over that in a little bit of time we have left, and then um, I won't go too deep into it just because I want to make sure that we have time for any questions anyone has. Um, I call this one in the script pack that your zip file you'll be able to download. Um, the with config option and deploy with config what we're doing doing with this is we're actually taking this configuration file here giving it some basic information about where our published settings file is the subscription you want to use for this specific job um, do you want to create a new main storage what that name is going to be is it a new container the name of that container do you want secondary storage? Do um, your de external meta store, do you want it external? Um, if you do, do you want a new one? If, it, if it's a um, new one, do you want a new server created? Um, the server name, username, on and on and on. And it goes through and takes all your configuration and then uses that information here so that you can actually, you know, does it need new storage? Yes, it does. And it'll write out to the log that it's creating a new storage using this storage account name that you've put into your XML file because right here it's getting the contents of that file and shredding the XML into values so that you basically get a variable tree that you can navigate through. And again, it uses all those configuration values to create all the different pieces, your metadata store, your storage account, and then it creates your cluster, either a basic or a custom cluster, um, with or without secondary storage, um, with or without an external meta store um, for you. And now again, there's not a lot of try catches in this, so when this errors, it just keeps going, so it'll crash gloriously um, because it'll just keep trying to go to the next step. There's nothing that'll kill it on error. Um, but again, this was a rough step of how, uh, or a rough draft of how you would want to automate this in your own environment. You can put, a, you can put all the try catches in there, um, the hard, you know, hard stops for any kind of error handling that you would want to do. Um, but I thought this would be good for a lot of people to kind of give them the beginning start of uh, getting going with um, automation. So then once it's created, you would say, there it is created. Um, and then within here is where you would add the additional steps for. Maybe you want to um, run a, create a specific pig job definition, or you want to create a hive job definition, 
And then you're going to want to add in diff additional lines to down, maybe download the file from your blob storage and on and on. Um, but again, this is where you would, this just gives you the building box, blocks to build the cluster um, because that's the most difficult step. But then again, at the end, you have your remove Azure HD Insight cluster and your cluster name. most important step. Okay? All right, so with that, with two minutes, two or three minutes to spare, um, does anyone have any questions? Hey, Josh. Yeah, I've been monitoring the questions, and up until just a second ago, we had no other questions. Uh, so we got one question for you. Uh, where can we find specific reference and guidance available for PowerShell for Azure HD Insight? Websites, books, etc. Um, websites are how I got started with it. So Microsoft Virtual Academy, um, if you're familiar with it. If you're not, just type that in, Microsoft Virtual Academy, add the .com on the end. They have a lot of great sources to, uh, courses to do um, uh, Azure um, manipulation with PowerShell, great PowerShell starter courses as well, and also some HD Insight courses. I use that and also a lot of the reference material on um, azure.microsoft.com. Um, they have some great demos uh, for building um, different pieces of Azure using PowerShell. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention earlier um, when I was going over the Azure PowerShell commandlets is, is when you download the Azure PowerShell commandlets, it's not just HD Insight. This gives you all the tools to manipulate just about every piece of Azure, including um, Azure ML, Azure Storage, Azure VMs, um, Azure Data Factory. I mean, it, it opens up a lot of doors for you um, to automate anything, really, um, in reference to Azure. All right. All right, folks, any other questions for Joshua? Uh, another question here. In HD Insights, since data is stored in Azure Blob, comma, yep. waiting for the rest of the question. <laughs> How is the distributed processing of Hadoop leveraged? Um, so the, the distributed processing itself, um, when the cluster is being set up, the nodes all have access to that storage account. Um, and that storage account is replicated anyways by Azure Storage. So the, the actual distribution of the data is already done um, natively by Azure Storage. And then you, when you're setting up the cluster, for instance, um, our examples, we're only using two nodes. So those two nodes um, then have access to that same storage account and um, are, do, are handling um, the distributed processing the same way an on-site you know, deployment would in that the two are being told by the head node which work they're going to be specifically handling. All right, next question. This, is, this one came in. Does uh, PowerShell make use of Yarn? Um, I believe it does. I haven't, I haven't um, dug too deeply in that yet, um, but I believe it does. But I can actually take that one offline. And um, Jason, if you could get me, um, or if I could get information, or if you hit me on, um, get, get back to me on Twitter or either one of my email addresses um, with this question, we'll you know, I'll research it and get back to you offline. All right. He shared his email address, so we'll get that over to you, Josh. Thank you very much. All right, folks, with that, we are at 12 o'clock Central, 1 o'clock Eastern, and whatever o'clock from wherever you are. Um, we will be meeting again in just a couple weeks on Monday the 23rd to go with a session on an introduction to Data Factory. Again, if any of you have anything with Azure that you've done that you want to share with others, uh, please reach out to the uh, Cloud VC, and we will get you scheduled in here so you can talk to the rest of your peers and share what you've been doing. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today. Thank you.